Hello, everybody. Hello. Aloha. Ah. Always feels like a miracle that we can all get together <laughs> like this. Never gets old. Well, it is a miracle. Yeah. Um, I hope you're well and please take the time to see each other. Wow. <laughs> okay. I'm Are we ready? With your attention around your solar plexus, just take a few deeper breaths. Notice what you feel, what changes appear, what energies or vibrations are felt, sense, experience. And then if you like, check in with the six sensitivities, the eye door, the ear door sensitivity, scent and taste. and our largest organ, which is the skin and flesh of the body. But continuously through body consciousness experiences the play of the elements, texture, temperature, pressures and vibrations, And sometimes yogis report feeling a lot of the other sense experiences all right here where we started. It's as if it's messaged back to the home consciousness, the heart mind. Generally, we feel light coming into the body through the eyes and sound vibration, through the ears and fragrance and scents through the nose and so forth. But some yogis on the month long retreat we just finished, sometimes would report feeling those sensations of sound and light all here the solar plexus.
It's not that we feel that all the time on our on a regular basis, but don't be surprised if sometimes experience appears and disappears, mostly in this area. But as an extension, we should know all our senses, not to the object of sight, but just to the seen experience and not to the object of sound, but the felt experience of sound vibration occurring at the ear sensitivity or as I say, it said sometimes it's felt in the solar plexus area, as well as throughout the body, just noticing sensations as they change. Some are pleasant, some are not, and some feel neutral or even numb. But that too is a kind of sensation. We usually miss it. So being alert to neither pleasant nor unpleasant sharpens our wisdom and our awareness. And the more we experience what's true, the more relaxed and calm the whole mind, body, energy field becomes. There's this body intelligence and sense door intelligence that knows what to do. And if you just allow that to happen, let mindful awareness join the party, so to speak, without interfering, forcing, doing, like rejecting or clinging, then it's just a very spacious and clear and fascinating process to observe. How does it happen? How do these sensations know what to do so that the body functions and hearing consciousness happens and visual consciousness occurs? It's a, it's a vast mystery actually. Uh, this all comes together in one moment, completely disappears, never to reappear. Another moment arises with an entirely brand new experience of sensation, sights and sounds, feelings, emotions, Our memory sometimes connects them as, oh, I know that, I remember that. But it's actually not the case. What arises in this moment we have never ever experienced before. Something like it perhaps. but it's brand new, like a, a new bloom unfolding its petals and its fragrance, including our awareness and the consciousness within which it, it arises. Brand new, never before having arisen.
You can even let the mindful awareness bend back on itself and know itself as a stream of silent observing awareness. And everything it's aware of, all the energies and vibrations and colors and sounds are like continuously pouring over a ledge like a waterfall into nothingness. The felt sense of that stream of phenomena is or is like an insight awareness into our anicca nature, the flow of nature, stream of impermanence. That's another reality or truth that is calming to know that settles the system because it's the truth. So we're less concerned by change, sudden or expected. It's nature. So see for yourself now, remembering wherever your touchstones are, your home anchor of the breath, notice that the abdomen or the chest with expansion and contraction arising and falling, or the hands or a touchstone or an anchor. Sounds can be an anchor, if it's, especially if it's a steady, continuous stream of sound vibration. And to experiment, experiment if you haven't, is sometimes observing the flow of silent awareness itself and getting to know the, the difference between the silent aspect of a true moment or moments of mindfulness versus when there's an intrusion of the discursive mind that's commenting or interpreting or analyzing. Just that awareness of a beautiful, pure moment. Of sati mindfulness increases its purity and its presence.
Thank you, Stephen. And um, I'm glad you talked about Vedana, the second foundation of mindfulness, as I, a lot of my talk is about that. So thank you. Um, so even though the um, month long retreat on the Brahma Viharas is um, over, I uh, haven't been quite moving out from that uh, context. Of course, we were doing that in the context of the Vipassana practice. Um, and I wanted just to remind everybody that the that stream of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling that Stephen was um, in how to be with that instructing today, um, that it's <clears throat> the second foundation of mindfulness that the Buddha taught. And he, they're, they're called pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings, but that doesn't mean an emotional feeling per se. It's a mental feeling that comes up. It arises um, simultaneously every moment so that when there's a moment of seeing, there's a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. If there's a moment of hearing, there's a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. It's a mental feeling tone. Or if there's a thought, it's a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. If there's a body sensation, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. You know, sound, uh, smell, taste. It, as we can see with emotion, happy, sad, there's a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. So that um, it's important to understand that even though we don't <clears throat> always see it or understand it, that, that it is simultaneous, simultaneous. So it's choiceless. It's a choiceless arising with every moment of experience. And um, one of the important aspects of this is that <clears throat> we're usually um, suffering because we don't understand that we're reacting to this process that actually is out of our control. So that, that's, it's so important to understand that it, it's really, freedom is really understanding how to um, relate to this moment to moment stream of change that's happening every moment of the sixth sense door. So it's also the understanding of this is that, um, we're born into a human body, mind, heart, right? That each moment there's also an uncontrollable seeing sight, smell, taste, touch, right? That the, that the six, that we're born into what the Buddha called the sixth sense doors, their doors, their holes, right? The skin has holes, right? The ear door, the nose door, the, the mind door, the um, most sensitive of all. So with any experience, um, one way I often try to offer working with our experience is to relate to, to it more like weather. So if you kind of gave a weather report of your last hour, <laughs> it would probably be much more um, accurate if you kind of took the body as the weather part of the weather weather map and the mind and it, it's it's like if you step outside your door it's much easier often for us when we step outside to get a sense of the the um, impact of wind or smell or um, temperature or earth element or just and and our um, the thoughts about it just that that if we could just stop and just just accept that there's this transforming process, not only of our body, of earth, air, fire, and water, and thoughts, emotions, that there's this uncontrollable change that's happening moment by moment. If we could kind of stop and see, even if we just took the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral as weather, it would be maybe a different perspective. You know, so if, you know, I, I feel like um, if you just took the change from night and day or wind 
or clear or, or snowing or cloudy or freezing, just this amazing change that we're living in. It's, it's really important to see the same thing is happening inside. And ultimately, each moment that appears as a moment of sight, a moment of smell, a moment of thinking, it, it's unique, it's new, it's always new, and it disappears, and it's, it arises, it disappears, it arises, it disappears. So one aspect of this awareness, silent awareness that Steve was describing in the instruction is that with practice, it becomes more and more impartial to the weather, to what's appearing, so that there's, we, get a, we get more of a relationship uh, with the experience, say, that appears of boredom or sleepiness or happiness. And often we can think of them as pairs. So it's like we're disconnected, there's, we're connected, or we're resisting, we're accepting. <laughs> You know, it's like the system is triggered. It's not triggered. It's, it's um, peaceful. There's a karmic knot. There's a storm. You know, the, there's this really interested, really bored, really caring, indifferent. And so there's this level of equanimity, of, of deep peace, acceptance that comes from relating to all of this different weather equally, because it's part of life. It's, it's, it's worthy of our attention equally. This is a poem by Sandor Wiores from Hungary. He lived 1913 to 1989. It's called Rain. The rain's pounding away at the rusty eaves, twirling, sliding, bubbling foam. Well, that's rain. You too. And I should walk now as free as that, on cloud, on air, the meadow and the vapor roads. <clears throat> Move around up there and here below like this liquid thing, flowing into human life on rooftops and on shoes. There's a kind of grace, a kind of grace falling from above in this, um, like a gift of rain. Um, but we can also see it as how life is, a gift. We can't really live without the weather. <laughs> when um, we're kind of rolling along, whether we're sitting, walking, or in our life, and um, sleepiness, low energy appears. The, just how do we relate to the change? It's low energy. It's just low energy. It's weather, right? Um, but if we think it's my sleepiness and that it's a problem, then we will resist it, we'll disconnect, and we won't be with the truth of the moment, yeah? And that, that it's the Buddha taught that it's the resistance to our experience that's so painful. Um, so it's this, we might disconnect from the experience of sleepiness or we can try going, oh, it's not mine, it's just low energy. It's like the weather changed, right? And it's so different, right? This acceptance, the peace, the non-struggle, but the, also the not taking it personally. 
we tend, I'm using the example of the weather because we do tend to not take it quite as personally. We don't think we can control it. Sometimes we wish we could, but it's much more clear that we can't. Um, so if we have the sense of whatever appears that we can be kind because it's part of life, it has appears, we can be connection connected, then we're building a relationship with that experience. We're getting the experience of how to relate to the experience with wisdom, with a Brahma Vihara, with love and wisdom. And there's this trust and freedom that develops um, that's so different than uh, feeling like at the whim of whatever experience is happening, just like bouncing along like a ping pong ball, reacting, reacting, reacting with aversion, reacting with attachment, but really we're just not aware that we're reacting to pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. <laughs> Um, so on the retreat, we were working a lot with pairings, like having, getting that when something painful is happening, that we can bring, we can call up compassion for the pain, but also we can bring up equanimity, accepting that things are as they are. It's like these pairings. So with the appearance of something pleasant, we can practice mudita, uh, appreciating the joy as well as equanimity, accepting that the pleasant will change, that it will be um, undependable ultimately, so that there's a, a balance with the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. So I'm, I want to give you an example. Um, <laughs> this is from a poet named A.R. Hammonds. Um, he said, Count your blessings, spelling them over and over into sharp contemplation. That's what we're talking about when we pair the mudita, the, the appreciating the joy, the gratitude for the joy with the equanimity. It's like we count the blessing, but we also appreciate that the blessing of joy of pleasant is impermanent it's not it's anicca dukkha anatta right that we bring in the wisdom of understanding it's impermanent of understanding that experience is unreliable because it's impermanent because we understand that it's not personal it's like the weather but we appreciate it we appreciate the pleasant pleasant isn't the problem it's the attachment to it that's the problem. So these pairings are meant to bring a kind of balance um, that really um, allow us to understand that, again, we're born into this. It's a given, the range, this unpredictable stream of change. And especially understanding that often if we're not aware of the pleasant, right, with a sound, a sight, a touch, et cetera, and we're, we shift immediately to liking it. It's, it's just, that's what the Buddha taught. It's just like, pay attention. But if it's pleasant, we'll start liking it. We're not aware of it. We'll start enjoying it. We're not aware of it. We start clinging to it. We start craving and there's addiction. And well, how did that happen? It's because we're not able to see that there's a mental feeling of pleasant with the with the with the appearance of the sound or the sight, et cetera, the, the thought. So we can see that one tool that we have that we often don't remember when when we're liking something or enjoying something and we start we're starting to feel like it's not impersonal it's not weather it's like I am enjoying this this is mine right I like it right I love pizza I love pizza that's from a movie but it's like I love pizza right? it's just like you know it just gets so intense and it's so personal and it's my pizza right? Who wants to share it? Hmm. So being able to step back and go, oh, enjoying, hmm. 
we can notice that with mindfulness, or we can also bring the mindfulness of mudita, which is shifting to not being hooked into the object, but actually appreciating, appreciating the joy. There's an unhooking, and then if we really want to find the balance, you bring in the equanimity, right? Where it's just like remembering that it's impermanent remembering that it's undependable, that it's remembering that it's impersonal. So again, it's, this brings about an allowing of the pleasant. It's, you're not rejecting it. You're not holding on to it. Pleasant isn't a problem. And so just as we get a relationship with um, pleasant and attachment, we can get a relationship with unpleasant and aversion and fear through, again, the, the, the building of a relationship with what appears as unpleasant. We build, we cultivate a relationship of compassion and equanimity, a relationship with the difficult like weather. So with unpleasant, if we're not aware of it, a sound, sight, smell, taste, touch, etc., memory, unpleasant, there's then the appearance of the disliking. We're not aware of it. We can always shift back to, oh, my good friend disliking and be right aware of it like a sound or a sight disliking. Usually it happens very quickly. There's aversion and fear, which are always usually unpleasant. Not always, sometimes we can be really, feel like anger is very, when we don't, when we're blaming somebody, it can shift to pleasant, <laughs> but it usually shifts to unpleasant. It's, that doesn't stay, the, the joy of blaming doesn't usually last too long, um, but it goes from the fear, aversion, hatred, terror, rage, war. All that comes from not being able to take responsibility for being born here and having this range of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. So with this, just as with the pleasant, we're um, learning that the appearance of unpleasant and pain isn't a problem. So there's no need to blame and hate or withdraw with fear or get rid of. Um, so that, that shifting to caring about the pain, not being stuck in it, it's not sticky. The compassionate awareness is, is pure, just caring about pain. And that's pleasant. It feels good to care about pain. And also again, bringing in the equanimity of just, Realizing that the pain is un unpermanent. That experience also is undependable and unreliable. And that it's impersonal. It's just like the weather. And that it's part of life, this, this range of pain, pleasure, joy, sorrow. And, and this, this, this resistance to pain, um, the resistance to the appearance of something um, unpleasant is very important to include, you know, more, more than most things in terms of our understanding of how to um, cultivate peace and trust in ourselves in the world. And it's just that, that sense of when our system says, no, no, <laughs> I don't want this. I don't want this to be here. And it's mine, right? It's my body pain. It's my aging. It's my anger. It's um, however it's appearing. Um, if we can't be with it, it's okay. You care about the resistance. You accept it. It's like this incredible tool of wisdom of bringing all our spiritual tools to, to know that there is always something else for the attention to pay attention to and to ground there and to not 
use our willpower to accept something we can't accept. It's, it's, it's the spiritual quality of equanimity that accepting, it's not us, right? It's not like we can, we can't say, accept this and make it as a command or a demand, right? It doesn't work that way. It's the appearance of the kindness. It's the appearance of the care, the appearance of the um, mindfulness. And the, if there's, there is that, oh, my good friend resistance can't be with this. You see if you can have compassion for that, equanimity with that, or you shift the attention to something else. It's like you just say, say there's um, something in the body we can't be with, we shift to sound. If there's something in the mind that's so painful we can't be with it, we might shift to metta just for our whole body. Of course, this is endless what I'm saying. There's ways we shift the attention so that it's not a force march to extreme aversion. And we don't even understand why we've gotten ourselves in a big knot. And so there's that reinforcing the groove of aversion to pain and resistance to pain, or there's an ability to see that there are other options. Uh, this is also from the poet A.R. Hammonds, born in the, um, I think around 1929 in North Carolina. Uh, A.R. Hammonds. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him at the end. He said, this is from a, a book of poems called Garbage. I'm afraid of convincingness. I'm afraid of convincingness. What harm it can do if there is too much of it along with the good. So I am now a little uncertain on purpose. You know, when we're so convinced of something, we're so convinced we're right. And even if there's all this goodness in it, there's so much harm that we can cause. And that there's that sense of like, oh, maybe we can bring a little bit of like relativeness to it, a little bit of uncertainty to our, like our extreme attachment to our view. I was, I'm gonna read just a few things from that book. Oh, that I have to start again out of the realization of failure. I love that. That can just be in one moment where we feel like, oh, we've disconnected. We can't be with whatever. And we feel like a failure. And yet we just have to start again. We take things so personally. We just get in. That's in the past. We did, we're doing the best we can. We start again. And last one, this was when he got older. <laughs> I can't believe I'm merely an old person. <laughs> Something so humble and free about that. I can't believe I'm merely an old person. <laughs> it's great, you know, acceptance. No aversion, just peace with it. When we talk about um, an imperturbable awareness or a spacious awareness, what's, what's really happening is that um, 
when that's when that relationship with reality is happening, there's enough solitude from objects themselves. So what, what's happening actually with a non-doing awareness is that the awareness is non-possessive of what's appearing. It's not possessive of the experience or the objects of what's appearing. The awareness isn't sticky. It's, the awareness is, is, is infused with wisdom. It's infused with peace. So when we talk about spaciousness, it's usually a non-interfering relationship with what's happening. We're, we're letting what's appearing be just as it is because we understand that things are just as they are, that we don't have to control. We can connect, we connect without controlling. And that, that's the, um, it's very important to understand that, that, that in that way, when that's happening, thoughts really are just thoughts and body sensations are just body sensations and pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings are just feelings. They are just as they are. And out of that acceptance of anicca, dukkha, anatta, out of the acceptance of impermanence, unreliability of experience, and um, the impersonal, uncontrollable nature of reality, that we actually can go beyond them. We go beyond anicca, dukkha, anatta. There's this great peace and, and um, imperturbability, spaciousness. So that kind of ultimate paradox in this deeper equanimity is that we're able to take total responsibility for taking birth. In this particular body, right, our unique particular body, mind, heart, we accept that. And the, 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 the unfolding of the pleasant, unpleasant, the unfolding of the karma, the living out karma moment by moment, We're taking responsibility, but we're not taking it personally, which can seem paradoxical, but that's where the freedom is, is under is in that deep understanding. So we see that all we can do is take responsibility with how we're relating to it. It's not the experience that matters. It's how we're relating to it again and again and again and again. And again, <laughs> so the actual unfolding of the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, as it that stream of change, how it's unfolding for us, the Buddha said was imponderable. Imponderable. So we can let that go. Why am I having this unpleasant thought? Because <laughs> 10 lifetimes ago, <laughs> I did this. He said not to do that because it's imponderable, but it, that, that we can get that we have this opportunity in the present moment to free ourselves of that karma by how we respond to it. It's so heartening. It's so liberating because that's all we have to do. We don't have to go back five minutes or 20 lifetimes ago. We just deal with what's unfolding moment by moment in the present. And so from that perspective, um, we don't need things to be happy. We see that we're not content. There's a contentment. We see we're not content when we're living in a world where how things should be rather than how they are. So there's a great uh, teacher Sri Nazargadatta Maharaj from India from this perspective where he says that we need to have the perspective 
There is nothing wrong with me. I have nothing to worry about. Or there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> I have nothing. You have nothing to worry about. Or there's nothing wrong with us. We have nothing to worry about from that perspective, from that deep place of peace. So I'd like to end with a poem by A.R. Ammons, who was born February 18th, 1926, died February 25th, 2001. He was born on a very rural, um, remote farm in North Carolina, and lived in Ithaca, New York. He was called the greatest American poet of daily chores. or a latter-day transcendentalist. <laughs> I went down by Cascadilla Falls this evening, the stream below the falls, and picked up a hand-sized stone, kidney-shaped, testicular, and thought all its motions into it the 800 mile per hour earth spin, the 190 million mile yearly displacement around the sun, the overriding grand hall of the galaxy with the 30 mile per hour of where the sun's going. I thought all the interweaving motions into myself, Drop the stone to dead rest. The stream from other motions broke, rushing over it. Shelterless, I turned to the sky and stood still. Oh, I do not know where I am going, that I can live my life by this single creek. So do you have any questions about the instructions, talk, your practice? Luca. <laughs> Thank you for all the offerings over the last month and for today. Um, I get confused when I hear you say, as you did at the beginning of the tour, other people say that Vedna is mental. Um, I think like, oh, you know, I feel a painful sensation in my foot or a pleasant sensation in my hand. Um, there's also the sort of the liking or the disliking, which doesn't feel like it's located there um, and which it might itself be pleasant or unpleasant. Can you, I, I, I can say more, but I don't know if that's enough for you to. That sounds good enough. Steve, do you want to start? Go ahead. Oh, um, 
I would have a question for you. Um, why doesn't it seem mental? Well, I mean, it, it, if by mental, we just mean that sort of uh, everything in the six sense doors is mental. And so a tactile sensation is mental, then uh, no. I'm on board. <laughs> yeah. But if, if something else is meant, something uh -huh. more specific is meant by mental, then all of the six sense doors, then uh, I let me put it this way. I would have thought that the, the painful sensation I feel in my foot is a tactile sensation. And if by, and so then when I hear you say mental, I think, do you mean mental in that broad sense in which a tactile sensation is mental? Or are you suggesting that no, the pain is not a tactile sensation? That's a great, it's such a good question. It's a really good question. And I think it's, um, again, uh, teasing it out. Steve, I can go on, but do you have anything you want to add before I do? Okay. Go on. Got it. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this is the crux, again, of the Buddha's teaching in a way where that second foundation is considered mind. So the first foundation of mindfulness is considered all aspects of the body. And when we tease out all aspects of the body, one of the aspects is the understanding that um, our body isn't ours and our body isn't mind, but actually there's earth element that's a reality. There's a real reality, earth, that's all the variations of soft to hard. And so, what I would say is that the softness um, and the hardness, the way the mind mind perceives that, will be mental. Meaning the 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 pleasant quality that comes with soft is mental, but the actual physical sensation is soft. It's earth. Does that is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. So that it's 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 very quick. It's very quick, but it's like, it's the whole, I mean, I remember when I first, I, we didn't hear much about Vedana in the early days. And for me, the first time I started to get this glimmer of freedom, but it was with sound. And it's just like, I just, all I wanted to do was sit by a stream for the rest of my life, because I found that very pleasant. And I used to try a lot but it's like you can't sit by a stream the rest of your life but i just like then i'd be in the meditation hall with all these people with coughs right and sneezes and bur burps and it's people like in the the dining room um making all these sounds and i would find them very unpleasant and it would be so much aversion and i'd keep going from you know wanting to be with the pleasant sounds and not the unpleasant sounds but i didn't understand it i just knew i was reacting and suffering and so that understanding that there might be warmth in the shoulder the appearance of warmth which is the understanding that that's actually not my shoulder it's fire element it's temperature it's a weather it's weather coming and then that the with it simultaneously there's a mental quality with it that's when when you can sink your attention into this and understand it that's when body and mind come together so you can tease out talking about it, but actually it's appearing simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, say all the different sensory qualities of a sort of specifically tactile qualities, none of them are in themselves intrinsically pleasant or painful or neutral. There's the plain pleasure neutral is another a separate existence. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank and you. how how we're perceiving it as pleasant, unpleasant, ne neutral is also karmically. It's all conditioned. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, Steve. Do you want to add anything? No. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I, I'm so I'm so caught in. It's unbelievable that I'm nearly old. <laughs> It's a good line. I know. Merely old. Yeah. It hasn't stopped reverberating in my system. <laughs>
I used to know all that stuff really well, Luca. Uh, I've forgotten most of it. I'm not sure I believe you. I don't believe him either. <laughs> Great. Catalina. Hello. Hello. I have a question. Um, how um, we can translate uh, being able to go in meditation uh, when you are in, in a retreat where everything is so sheltered and so safe and so calm and you are able to reach that level of quietness and acceptance and calm <clears throat> and then you have to go back to your real life and open the computer and answer emails and do the all the work that the person has to do and how is there a way to translate um you know that that the discipline you know that discipline that focus that a uh, concentration that bring you to that place of calm a simplicity and serenity and to when you are living in the not a real life of having to work and especially the computer like oh i see that computer and <laughs> I mean, do you like have to answer emails it's like oh and another one and another one <sighs> So, yeah, any any suggestions? It's unpleasant for, you know, it's coming up as unpleasant. And so aversion, if you're disliking it, you can be with it. It's like you don't try to get back to the calm. You let your system be agitated. It's agitated. It's okay. Like, okay. You know, you can, you know, I like listening to the way different the sound of people when they're you can hear on the keyboard if somebody's angry blah, 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 right or like you know trying to rush or like oh they touch each little letter like it's like a pear to be eaten right like it's like it's just like so different it's like a complete mirror of you know every way that we are it's so hard to get that it's the impartiality so that it's totally okay that you sit down and you know you you don't try to go oh come on Catalina this is wonderful we're going to have a positive time and it's really going to be great you just sort of go okay let's just do the best we can to not like this and do it that would be a big achievement In fact, you could even start with, <laughs> I like to joke around with it. I just, I can start with, we, we hate this. <laughs> we, we hate this. It's okay. You just try, if you are light with it, it's not that bad. But if it's like, you're totally feel like not liking it is wrong, then it's a real bummer. Because you've disconnected from the truth. Yeah, not easy, especially if you're trained that you're not supposed to be, avert, you know, if you're trained to be like you're supposed to not be 
aversive, then if you're aversive, it takes more effort than to be calm, <laughs> to be okay with it. It's all that's, yes. yeah, yeah. Sounds very, very, very wise. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it is, it's the reaction of something is just acceptance. Well, I hate right. it. So right. it's all right. You right. hate it. Just yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And try it because you might find that sometimes it can be, you know, other than, I mean, I'm sure Steve and I could come up with 10 million things to kind of taking breaks at the computer is, you know, really helpful and actually because of an injury I have to stand up a lot and work at the computer sit down when I'm standing up I'm like oh maybe I could go to the bathroom right like you know it, what a novel idea you know maybe I can go get a cup of tea or when you're sitting there it can get really like you just in prison for hours but actually I found that the injury has actually helped me be freer at it and, and it's the little thing but it's it's a big thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know, Steve. Do you have more to say about that? <laughs> you 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 can spend some long but, time. I, mean, I find it helpful <laughs> to realize when we when we leave the shelter of that calm and quiet, the the rest, the solitude, the seclusion. We're not going back to reality. We're leaving reality. We're going back to proliferation, mental proliferation, fabrication, expectation, just how we color everything with a lot of reactivity. And so then, as Michelle says, if we just try to take a piece of that solitude and, and ask ourselves, well, how can I how can I restore that for a moment right here and now, right in this moment with this breath or, or this push of the buttons on the computer, just taking, finding wherever we can a touchstone to take a moment to return to the reality that we know is, is true, is felt sense and not all the proliferation and imagination we attach to the experience we have when we leave meditation, when we leave a retreat, when we leave those moments of solitude and protection. Yeah. And, you know, I would, I think just to add, this is a huge conversation because I think the more you put yourself in it and it's a kind of, um, groove of not liking it and it being a drag the stress the stress is because you're caught in time so as to, to follow it the thread of what steve's saying i do think that adding in little things to make it more pleasant can be helpful you know you have to think of the way that might work for you like i mean i like i have an app that shows me the wind with, and here we go, the weather again, but it's really helpful. I go to this app where it's showing all the different directions of the wind around the island I live on. And it's like, it's not that long a break, but it brings me, for me, it brings me a lot of joy. You see, like I, I just changed the channel for a second, you know, and um, it's like changing that like constant groove of not of like being caught in the, the computer for so long. I really think it can get to be like, you can't get, wait to get out of the house. And, but it becomes a habit that you wanna keep breaking up the, um, the groove of it as best you can. I know it's hard, but um, some people put in their computers a thing that stops it every 10 minutes or 15 minutes. They, their computer actually shuts down they, they actually put that in so that they make themselves take a break. Or just for a few lines, if you're typing in the background, can you notice touch sensation, touch sensation, texture, smooth, pressure, 
I mean, you probably can't sustain that and, and do the conceptual for too long, but just little bits of time. Well, what's really happening here? It's touch, it's smooth, it's soft, or your thoughts about communicating. If you notice those, that's reality. I'm thinking this, I'm wanting to communicate this. And actually doing that makes us have more healthy, skillful thought process, writing process, communicating process. So wherever we can come in with this awareness and not reactivity or not complacency of just doing things habitually, that's helpful, it's good. Your training, everything we do then is a training. Like the idea of mindful dishwashing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is it David or David Gloria? And Gloria? Or Dave oh, and Gloria? One of you. Maybe it's both of you. <laughs> Um, it's Gloria. And um, yeah, I know that you've, you know, you've said this probably 500 times already, but I, um, I think I finally maybe understood what you were saying five or about this whole idea of, um, you know, mental feeling tones being paired with a moment by moment experience and how, um, how in my mind, I might, you know, like Luca was saying about, well, he might have, might have sensation in his feet and then it goes to like unpleasant. And then I might stay there in unpleasant. And meanwhile, I've just lost, you know, two minutes, five minutes, a half hour, whatever it is in um, caught up in that unpleasant or pleasant or neutral feeling tone. But meanwhile, I've lost all of these other moment by moment experiences. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I don't know if, you know, Steve might say something uh, as well, but um Can you give me an example? Um, well, just, you know, in, in, um, in meditation practice that, you know, um, I might, I might have a, uh, you know, hear something and then I might have a reaction to it. And so then I'm in the reaction mode and I've just lost, so to speak, you know, um, my other moment by moment uh, sensations that are, that are going on. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. Unless um, you're aware of the reaction moment. Say that again. Unless you become aware of being caught or stuck in reactivity. Then that too is present time awareness. So that's how we don't we don't lose anything just because there's a reaction happening. It's actually an opportunity how to decondition the reactivity to notice that. So really nothing is lost, is it? I like that way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I, I think it's really, it's just, just getting the sense that um, when you get how moment to moment, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral really is, it's like, say you're with something like a sound and it's unpleasant, it has an unpleasant feeling sound, tone. You know, for me, it's usually the weed whacker next door usually will appear 
it's like it's and we it sometimes it's good to investigate it what what it why is it why is there an unpleasant feeling tone it's not out there the unpleasant isn't out with the sound the unpleasant is happening in the mind with this the hearing there's unpleasant with a moment of hearing consciousness with knowing hearing there's an unpleasant feeling tone um if the attention doesn't like it and disconnects from that there as steve says there's nothing lost it just moves to the attention move disconnected from the hearing or the sound you know and it went to maybe some thinking about it or aversive thinking about it as steve said there's if there's thinking happening there's no problem it's only if then we disconnect from that thought and we shift to another thought and we're not aware that thinking's happening right so so what when we feel like we're losing something it's usually that we're um lost in the thoughts and that the attention isn't getting isn't noticing there's even any space between the thoughts and it's not able to um, connect with something other than this uh, papancha right this reactive thinking chain right so what what we're saying is that some somebody might actually experience that as pleasant some somebody might experience like getting lost in thought is pleasant somebody might experience it as uh, right this is what's so amazing some people might find it unpleasant or neutral but it's that ability to go oh they usually just go oh thinking or you think oh something was unpleasant there was aversion right you kind of just um i think of it as yielding to the moment rather than feeling like um you you lost something Good. Yeah. It, yeah. It's and it's so fast. Really, really, it's so fast. Usually for me, I I don't try to be aware of the stream of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. I'm usually noticing if there's aversion or attachment. Um, I'll notice that oh something's unpleasant or something's pleasant, and I'm not aware of it. And I'm just you know the there's a reaction, but actually it helps to accept oh something's pleasant or unpleasant. I hope that's helpful because we're not yes. suggesting that you'd spend the whole 45 <laughs> minutes um, trying to track that stream of unpleasant, pleasant, neutral. You can somewhat, but it it um, it would get grueling. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It is hard to stay on that <laughs> crystal clear reality moment to moment awareness. Our teachers used to love it when we'd come in and ex you know, express how much pain we were having and how caught up in the pain, how angry and aversive and how we were thinking of home and our comfort of our food and family and this and that. They'd laugh and, and say, oh, dukkha, good, 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 dukkha, you know, as a way to just hold that reality, that aversion, that anger, that desire, that wanting mind, that not wanting mind, not just saying, well, you should be with pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. It's true that the reaction comes from attachment to pleasure and aversion to unpleasant and ignorance about the neutrality, but it's really hard to sustain that. So we also have to be really good at being aware and opening to and feeling all the reactive states. Everything that happens when we lose touch with pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. It's so fleeting. It teaches us so much about Anicca. So how can we possibly stay with it for very long before we do go into reactive thinking, as Michelle was saying? We can't. So we have to get good at sort of mindfulness on the go. Mindfulness with all the reaction, reactivity and patterns, thinking patterns that we have. That's what slowly kind of undermines their, their roots, their roots, their hold in the heart.
Cynthia. Cynthia. Mm -hmm. You got to unmute there, Cynthia. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little more about rolling up the mat. <laughs> is that is that exactly because uh, when you s said that a, a little while ago, does it is it the way does it feel the way it sounds? I guess that's what I want to know. How does it sound to you? It's something that's in the commentaries that happens at a certain stage of insight but people have a different take on it. So what is yours? Well, I don't really know what it means, but what it feels like is a lot of, what I'm experiencing is in and out of a lot of doubt. That's and and um, so, so, maybe, so maybe up. I'll roll up my mat and go home right. where home is. Uh, but the trouble is there's, I don't know what else I'd do. <laughs> yeah, it's used a lot that way when people just are slam up against the, the wall of doubt and don't know what to do anymore or exhausted, you know, from endless um, stuff coming up impinging through the sense doors. It's actually used at a stage of insight where um, everything becomes very clear and just a lot of joy and bliss and, and um, faith and confidence in the practice and courage you know, to, to keep going. And then reaching a point of the, a, an early equanimity not the later mature equanimity, but it's still something never before experienced and feeling so fulfilled that they think they're done. And they often roll up the mat and go home because they think, they're, oh. they think they've reached everything and maybe beyond the teacher and they don't need to practice anymore. <laughs> That's not where I am. You know, okay, that's, that's very helpful. <laughs> there, there, there's like so much to be said about what you're saying. And I, I think that um, there's, there's also like, a, as Steve said, we can give you different things about stages of insight, but there is a stage of insight where it's scary that um, what seemed like everything was arising and passing and just kind of easy to notice, you know, a breath come and go by itself, a sound come and go by itself. And it feels like everything's kind of somewhat under control. <laughs> and then th that what's appearing starts to not have a beginning or a middle. It's just dis everything's kind of disappearing and it's very groundless. And, um, there is the feeling of like, um, the feeling is that this is impossible. I can't be with this. And um, that's, there's like, I, I can't do it. And so the doubt is, I actually can't do this. This is too much. This is, it's overwhelming. And um, what usually happens with more practice, which I'm hearing, <laughs> hearing in you, is that you really start realizing actually this is how it is i really can't get away from it i can change the channel which i'm encouraging you to do a lot um you really have to change that channel because the only time you can really be okay with it is with is if equanimity is present so if equanimity isn't present it's going to be like not only difficult but it also can kind of bring up other stuff of where one felt like overwhelmed or helpless or hopeless, right? Like, it's like, you have to be careful of where this intersects um, others material. <laughs> and um, that's why I'm so encouraging you to change the channel when you need to. 
Okay. But it's good. It's really good practice and you're doing great. And um, it's always good for all of us to keep in mind that um, usually we don't have doubt when things are going our way. Really, like, think about it. Think, you know, when things are, you know, when you, people ask you how you are and you're saying how great it is or like things are, you know, okay, or we don't say like we're feeling hopeless and like it's horrible and it's, you know, self-hatred. It's usually when things aren't going our way and it's hard and then another, it's like when it rains, it pours, right? And things are really hard. Then we have doubt and it's really hard and it's, it's really just um, so essential for all of us to remember when doubt is happening there's a recipe there's usually a lot of pain happening and we don't like it and we, we we think it's our fault and that we should be able to control it and it's so it's we're so hard on ourselves when actually we need so much compassion and metta and changing the channel um, and getting some um, enough out of the dukkha uh, to um, get some air we need air right i encourage a lot of air okay yeah i also like cynthia when you said well if you rolled up the mat <laughs> and walked away what would you do yeah yeah so maybe kind of combining michelle's tendency to use humor and exaggeration you could actually do that when you felt like it. Roll up your mat, and get up, walk away, and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> I'll try that. <laughs> Thank Please you. Please report back. <laughs> Ananya. I wanted to share that when I heard you first say, roll up the mat, I didn't think of it as giving up. I thought of it as the moment of realization that you're attached to the practice, that there's a certain kind of craving around the practice and around achieving enlightenment. And in that moment, you just let go. You've rolled up the mat in a sense and moved into more equanimity. Mm. Mm. So a complete surrender. Yeah. Yeah. You're not attached to the, the trappings, the mm -hmm. mat, the meditation room, the quest, any of it. It's a, it's a different interpretation. It's great. Yep. Yep. And a really good attitude to have from the very first moment we learn meditation. The attitude of not holding on to anything. Yeah. Very hard to do, though. But wonderful thing to come back to. Yeah, it's what you can come back to and come back to and come back to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Happy 2022 February. <laughs> we made it this far. That's how I see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're doing good. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> We're merely old. <laughs> You're merely old. <laughs> I'm merely old. <laughs> Hmm. Have a good week.